السلام عليكم مرحبا بكم في CNCF مينا العربي كيتس عربي We are hosting today Nick Nick is from on that and we'll be talking on the series of application modernization and we'll tackle the data on the application modernization part of it So basically we'll tackle uh, what is cloud data or most likely cloud native data and we'll leave it to Nick to present him to introduce himself and to start the presenting. Welcome, Nick. Okay, thanks very much, Walid. I'm uh, delighted to be there today with you guys. So hopefully it's gonna be a fun and interesting session. So uh, my name is Nick. I'm a principal developer advocate with OnDat. I've been there about uh, six months, even though it looks like it's been years now, <laughs> but I guess it's just the Kubernetes you know, landscape, how it moves uh, quickly. And so yes, Walid, today I'm gonna be talking about cloud native data, and stateful application all about databases. So hopefully it's gonna be fun, yeah. Okay, uh, do you want to share your screen? Yeah, sure, we can get started if you want. I don't know if you want to add anything or if we can get yes. uh, uh, so, in the weed. Yeah, so folks, we will have uh, again uh, uh, giveaways. We'll have three KCNA vouchers and uh, we can have also AWS credit. Uh, the vouchers are from Andrew Brown and his team at Example. So basically what we will do, we have a form that I will share with you and uh, we will do a random, uh, basically draw at the end to select the three winners. And if you have any questions, uh, you can f uh, put it in the form or ask on the uh, chat, please. Uh, thank you. Okay, so um, I've shared my screen. I think you have to put it on, right? Yes. Okay. So let's get to it. So approximately the talk should be around, um, I would say 40, 45 minutes, depending on you know questions and things like that. I'm gonna be monitoring uh, the question on my right. So if you see me looking on the right, it's because I'm gonna be checking the questions. So again, the talk for today, uh, we're gonna be focusing on cloud native data 101, how to run and play in your stateful application. So basically, whether you're a total beginner into Kubernetes or a mo more advanced user, uh, storage and persistent data is always something that kind of, you know, is left on the side. So hopefully today uh, we can, you know, shed some light. Uh, but first, I want to address, actually, the, the talk is divided into the first part is really talking about how enterprise should run data today, like on-premises uh, versus the cloud. And then in the second part, we're going to be focusing more into how to do it in the cloud, but more specifically uh, with Kubernetes as the cloud operating system. So first, I want to address what are the motivations for you as an architect or as a developer who are, you know, just as a business decision maker, why you would want to build your stateful application and run basically your data um, inside public cloud providers, you know, services. So here, let's uh, make it clear what we are talking about is, is basically platform as a service. Things like RDS, or you know, you you want to run a database that is managed by the cloud provider. It's not managed by yourself. You manage the data, you manage the application, you manage the eventually the middleware, but the data is run by the cloud provider, meaning that uh, it's responsible for the infrastructure, it's responsible for uh, the management, the scale, all of that is prov provided by um, the cloud provider. So as opposed to on-premises you know, solution where you have to deploy the database, you know, prov uh, provision and provide the underlying infrastructure, whether it's you know, disk, servers, network, that costs a lot of money. And you, if you look at the data center, uh, you know, just uh, hardware refresh uh, rate is probably, you know, I would say depending on the country, on the region, I'm not sure for MENA, but let's say for maybe US, Europe, uh, what I've been seeing is mostly between, you know, three to seven 
every three to seven years, you have to renew the hardware. I used to work for Cisco and, you know, we obviously also had a lot of customer in, in MENA. And yeah, typically this, uh, you know, five years is a good, is a good number where you just uh, renew your hardware. Right, and migrate some of the stuff you have into this new hardware, whether it's server, network switches, SAN storage, all of that costs money. And obviously you can abstract this layer when you are going into the cloud. So that's one valid reason to build data services um, into the cloud as opposed to on-premises. So a second one, so we'll be talking about infrastructure, a second one, economy of scale. Of course, you know, you cannot really plan how successful your application is going to be if you're working for a bank and maybe working on a front end or a user-based application or if you're doing business a b2b kind of uh, application depending on your customer um, your customer base how you grow you may have to scale your database or your stateful application and so again if you do it on-prem it requires a lot of potentially manual action if you don't have like a built your in your private cloud where you enable this you know self service provisioning scalability elasticity within your data center then it can be you have to do this all manually right so in 2022 it's not savvy to run and operate an application that you know has scale requirements uh, if you don't have either a private cloud solution meaning that you have all the automation and you know the engineering, the DevOps uh, practice um, to operate this. Um, so it's better to do it in the cloud because in the cloud, by default, it's going to be elastic. By default, you're going to be a l having a lot of different you know uh, DevOps uh, tooling. And another one is also we're talking about this DevOps tooling is how you want to integrate your data within your application ecosystem. So. Again, if you're building an application that is on-prem, well, you can only do with the tools you currently have. So in terms of innovation cycle, um, it tends to be a lot slower, right? So if you're in the cloud, as soon as you know, AWS, Google, Microsoft release a new set of features, uh, you can start using it as a fraction of the cost of its implementation, because of course the bill is going to be a lot high, uh, higher for the cloud provider, the hyperscaler, uh, to build the solution that is underpinning uh, the service. But as a consumer, well, you just have to provision the service, uh, you know, three click or one command line or just one couple of line of code with the SDK, and and off you go. Right, you can start to build your innovation by leveraging the hyperscaler innovation cycle. So you stay you know, very competitive compared to your competitors. And basically, it gives you a potentially a competitive advantage. And the last one, why you may want to build your stateful application and database in the public cloud is, of course, high availability disaster recovery. So for sure, um, in the past, everyone noticed that it's not uncommon to have uh, issues in AWS or in Google, Microsoft, all of them. So what is the right architecture for you? So of course, you need to have more than one AZ, uh, potentially multi-region if you want to do some sort of load balancing or caching closer to the user. All those kind of things, again, in the cloud, is, it just makes sense to do it there. Right? It's very easy. You can consume all those features quite easily. Uh, if you run your own data center and you have an application that is latency sensitive for the user, uh, well, it's not very much a good idea if you have a single data center and your objective is to conquer the world, right? That doesn't really work this way. So yeah, it makes a lot of sense to run data application. And actually, why you want to run data close to the application is because of latency, right? The closer you have your data set to the application, um, you know, the, the, the fastest your application will behave, uh, potentially, you know, assuming that you don't have any application issues, like from a latency perspective, you want to avoid the, late, the, the latency coming from the application accessing the data, right? So uh, another thing I wanted to clarify is what we, we, we talk when we, we, we what we mention, uh, or what we mean when we, we are talking about uh, stateful application, right? So, uh, as opposed to stateless, 
one thing I'm always you know saying is that there is no really such thing as a completely uh, stateless application. We've been you know working with um, you know especially in Kubernetes with containers and uh, front end and uh, web application. All of those at some point they still need to st to store some data. What is different between like prior patterns like 15 years ago and the patterns we have today with microservices is back in the day uh, where we have this monolith application, usually you only had a very large um, database and every team and you know every service was making use of that particular gigantic database. And then the DBA would manage this large chunk of data into you know, a couple of very large databases. Now, with the, with the advance of um, microservices, what you see realistically when you deploy a more cloud-native application is that every team will be responsible for um, a couple of microservices, and every team and set of microservices will access their own data sets, which means that they, are, they will be probably managing their own message queuing solution or their own database, right? So from a large database, we are moving away from that model to um, smaller um, and more databases running. And the responsibility is also kind of um, setting, it's basically an exploded model where the DBA is not like part of a single team. You will find people in every teams responsible for a couple of microservices who will be managing those databases, right? So it makes also more sense for those kind of approach to use the cloud again, like whether it's uh, scale up or scale out, it's, it's the same sort of principle. And here I'm displaying uh, the magic quadrant for a cloud database management system uh, from uh, December 2021 from Gartner. And you can see that, of course, when it, it comes to you know, running data in the cloud and moving this center of gravity from your data into the cloud, well, the first ones are obviously AWS, Microsoft, Google, and also Oracle, because of course, Oracle does propose Oracle as a you know service into Oracle Cloud, and what I've seen is a lot you know customer actually moving to Oracle Cloud for that very particular reason because they are they, they're you know like a historical customer who have been using Oracle database for you know decades, so it makes sense for them to move into Oracle at least for that particular um, portion of application, right? So now whether the um, you know, it brings again the question, should, you know, I've been talking about potential, uh, you know, failure in the cloud, multi-AZ, multi-region. And now I've also mentioned people using cloud for a particular reason. Like you may be running AWS for your standard workload, but for your database, because you're using Oracle, you may want to choose Oracle. So which, which brings me to the question, at the same time, I'm checking if there are any questions there. Not at the moment, that's cool. So, which bring me Don't to the worry. yep, <laughs> yeah. You you will tell me, okay, <laughs> yes. if there are any questions. Super. So, which bring me to the question: Should you have a multi-cloud strategy? All right. So, uh, especially when you want to run data in the cloud, well, you may want to do that, but just do it for the right reason. Just consuming multiple clouds because it allows you, maybe you think, to provide better availability. Although the argument may be correct, the cost versus benefit ratio, if it's only for that, maybe, you know, because think about this, right? You, you need to, if you, you're running into multiple clouds, a database into multiple clouds, you will have to learn all the tool set that comes with it. Um, in so in the AWS Azure Oracle Cloud, uh, you know I don't know or Alibaba Cloud, Ali Cloud, all of that. It's like if you're a developer, it's almost like learning different you know programming languages. So if you want to use different cloud just for high availability, it doesn't necessarily make sense just for that. But of course, uh, my personal view on um, multi-cloud is is just is just happening because. 
uh, you know, not necessarily because of requirements, just because of how the business is run, like mergers, acquisition, or again, if you're a large, you know, Oracle customer and you want to migrate your databases in the cloud, it may it will make sense to use Oracle at that moment, right? So always think about your use case and the reason why you have more than one cloud. Uh, my personal experience is it's not necessarily a technology uh, um, you know, reason. Most of the time, it will be a business reason. But anyway, uh, long story short, here this is you know some statement by Garner, um, and I kind of yeah I do believe in this prediction where by 2022, which is this year, 75 percent of all databases will be deployed or migrated to a cloud platform with only 5% ever considered for repatriation to on-premises. That's quite interesting, right? So by, this is hyperscaler solution, right? LDS and you know, Bigtable, all those kind of managed databases. Um, another one, so by 2023, cloud preference for data management will reduce the vendor landscape with the growth in multi-cloud, increases the complexity for data governance and integration. And finally, cloud DBM's revenue will account for 50% of the total uh, database management system market revenue. So what really that shows us is that uh, we we're, we're proceeding, you know, in the process of migrating all the data into the cloud. So that means that what and remember, data is what makes a business valuable. Not I mean the data and how you use that data for sure. But what that means is the center of gravity is literally moving from on-prem to the cloud. Uh, that includes all the adjacent area, security, uh, storage, all that is migrating to the cloud, compliance, you know, upgrades, all of that is, all those operational uh, components needs to be migrated into the cloud. So um, let's go to the next one. But the reality is, or well, the question we should also ask ourselves is, is there a better way? Is there a better way? Because um, I'm not going to lie here. Probably a lot of you have exper experiments this, experienced this. Sorry, like the cloud pro cloud providers, hyperscalers. Uh, you know, you have one meeting with your solutions architect. You say, okay, I've got this problem. Okay, the cloud is always the answer because there's always a service um, that will match your requirement. But the the challenge is again. Maybe that's a good fit for uh, one, particular, one particular problem, but maybe you have another problem that requires another cloud, or you have, a, you, know, um, you have to make use of another service that is attached to the one you are consuming. And slowly, gradually, you are consuming more and more services, potentially different clouds, and suddenly you have this massive chunk of operations a requirement that are uh, falling into the operational team and you need to adapt all your processes quite fast, right? So as you slowly migrate to the cloud, you also migrate all your IT processes in the cloud. So that's a good thing for the cloud service provider, but maybe that was not your initial thought and suddenly you have to migrate because you, the cloud providers, they don't, leave you a choice. They don't give you the choice. And again, as I was saying earlier, project number two, I mean, project number one, this is a MongoDB database. That's fine. You, you do it in the cloud you're currently using. Second project, oh, you have to go to Google. This is big table. Or you have to use Oracle. Oh, this is going to be happening into Oracle Cloud. What do you do with your ecosystem services or you know your DevOps tools that maybe we're running into Azure? Well, now you are in hybrid environment where potentially you will be using DevOps tool from Azure, DevOps tool for AWS, DevOps tool from Oracle. If you have, if you are a large customer and you have the knowledge, then that's perfect, right? But again, if you are a smaller customer and have to manage, um, you know, all the things with a couple of people, then the learning curve is really, really steep. So, is is there a better way to do that, right? So. The answer is, in my opinion, yes. <laughs> but oh, while well, it is coming there, okay. <laughs> yeah, there is uh, 
there is a suggestion from one of the aud uh, audience. Uh, he's saying for multi-cloud strategy for database, we recommend as a best principle strategy to be no vendor lock-in between them. What do you think? Yeah, so actually, the my opinion is actually exactly my opinion is exactly what I'm going into, which is instead of relying on the cloud vendor to bring you this um, kind of standardization, because in the end, this is what we need. We need standardization to be cloud agnostic, right? And to do that, rather than using all three of them, right? Because the problem, if you use all three of them, you're locked in three clouds, right? Or more, like <laughs> it's still a lock-in because the end solution still depends on the cloud you're using, right? So my preference then, and this is where I'm going, but it's like a teaser, is if you go in any cloud, so whether it's AWS, um, Oracle Cloud, Google, whatever, they all have Kubernetes managed solution, right? Or that's one, right? So you have in all clouds, you will find a Kubernetes managed solution, and then you can leverage, leverage Kubernetes to run your database. And because you have the Kubernetes layer, this is the standardization because you run it the same way you run, you know, your manifests, your application manifest, your database manifest, your database operator will stay the same regardless of the cloud. So that's a way to standardize everything. Now, if you even want to bring this standardization even one step further, you can still say, look, EKS, EKS, OKS, whatever the name, <laughs> OKA, I can't remember the, all the names, you know, they are still proprietary control plane, meaning that you have access to the worker nodes. Uh, so they are still some sort of locking because you're depending on the, the, the hyperscaler to manage your uh, Kubernetes environment. So what you can do is choose a solution like Rancher or uh, OpenShift. But I mean, yeah, OpenShift is probably a bad example because every cloud has also a managed OpenShift solution. So Rancher or similar solution, let's say, <clears throat> where you can essentially, from a central point of management, deploy a standard Kubernetes cluster anywhere. Right. And there, you are completely independent, and you're not locked in anymore. But there's, you're all, always locked in into something. So in that case, your only locking will be Kubernetes. But Kubernetes is open source, right? So it's it's better to be <laughs> locked in into Kubernetes than being locked in into AWS, right? Because the what Kubernetes will cover is much broader, right? So you can, and then you can start building all your services inside Kubernetes. So function as a service, you can build your pass environment, your DevOps tools. Instead of consuming hyperscaler tools, you can start building them in Kubernetes if you want to, right? I'm not saying that you have to, but if you want to continue to standardize your tool sets, um, then this is also something you can consider doing, right? Hopefully yes. that makes sense. Yeah, we'll continue after. <coughs> it's. Uh can be a long winded question this one <laughs> okay but anyway I, I've, I've done like some spoiler already of what I'm, I'm going to be talking about so yeah so basically this kubernetes approach is what I'm going to tell you um, for about for the next um, you know half hour what time is it oh I'm talking too much yeah <laughs> about 20 minutes or so so uh, the idea is if we take a look at uh, these are the most popular container images in, in, in the industry. So look at them and it's like, what, 14 of them? Most, more than half of them are meant for stateful application. Redis, database. Postgres, database. Uh, RabbitMQ, I mean, Elastic has some stateful component. RabbitMQ, also uh, message queuing, stateful. MySQL, Mongo, Kafka, uh, Vault to some extent, etcd. Uh, all of that are already stateful applications. So if those containers are the most images are the most popular to run in Docker, then obviously they will you know, have a good play in Kubernetes. That's a good fit into Kubernetes, but not just like that. You need some extra intelligence in Kubernetes to make your database application, a more generally speaking, stateful application work properly. Uh, and this is why I'm talking about Kubernetes as a cloud framework. If you start positioning Kubernetes as, a, uh, as your standardization layer, then you can also start making use of um, 
the operator um, paradigm. So the operator ID is essentially to replace some of the database or application operation, like manual operation, by something that is automated. So the ID of the operator, or Kubernetes operator, is to create automation within Kubernetes. Right? The ID is to extend, again, the Kubernetes API to create uh, first-class objects. Things like a database doesn't have any, exist any existence in Kubernetes nowadays by default. Right? But what you can do is rely on the MongoDB operator for MongoDB, for example, in, in, in if you see on the screen, that particular example is MongoDB. So let's say you want to build a MongoDB um, database into Kubernetes. There's two solutions. You can do it manually, uh, but then how do you manage to scale? So if you have a three-node cluster, um, three-node MongoDB cluster, how do you manage the scale of, of that cluster? Because if you build it with a stateful set, let's say, um, Kubernetes will manage the number of containers. So, okay, I'm going to increase my database cluster from three to five nodes, right? Okay, I'm increasing the number of containers. That's fine. But it doesn't increase the, it doesn't scale the application layer. It doesn't scale the database number of nodes. It just scale the number of containers, but not the application on top. So that's a perfect good use case for the operator. So if you look at the operator, uh, you know, the MongoDB operator, whether it's the enterprise or the community one, you will have a bunch of parameters you can manage by using an extension of Kubernetes primitives. So effectively, you end up with the definition of a MongoDB database natively in Kubernetes. So that means that when you create a database, Kubernetes will be able not only to scale the number of containers, but also take care of the database layer and also do things like backup and organize snapshots, do recovery, um, all those kind of uh, monitoring, uh, managing you know, user permissions, all those uh, you know, management uh, operation for your database can be achieved by using a database operator. So, and there, there are. I, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna stop discussing operator because this is not the top the topic for today. But if you go on operatorhub.io, you will find a lot of different database operators, uh, and there are companies who specialize into creating those database operators, uh, like Percona, or you also every basically you know every every database will have an operator. So my advice is, if this is something that you consider, because um, you know the argument of running your database in Kubernetes is appealing to you, then don't do it manually. Use an operator for that. And you will have probably to test more than one. Um, so to finish up on that particular note, what are the pros of running your um, database, uh, your Kubernetes, I mean, your database inside Kubernetes versus running it directly into the cloud? Right, by using a database as a service um, type of service, right? So here the idea is still the same. You want to deploy your database uh, outside of your data center, but for Kubernetes, you're gonna be running it in the cloud in Kubernetes. And for um, you know the second part, which is just consuming database as a service, it's running in the cloud, but the whole database is managed by the hyperscaler. So the pros for Kubernetes, you can save costs. How? Uh, I mean, we can go a lot deeper uh, into how, but the idea is this one. So if you look at uh, EBS or Google Persistent Disks, um, and in particular, if you want a certain degree of performance, if you want high performance, uh, something like, uh, you know, uh, Wizard, uh, Wizard, how is it called in AWS? Reserved IOPS or Reserved... Uh, can't remember the name, reserved IOPS, reserved IOPS, something like that, right? But where you you have to you, you need to have the guarantee you want to have the guarantee that your drive can uh, push that many IOPS, right? So usually uh, it tends to be very expensive um, the larger you go, right? So the idea here, in, in, instead of using one large drive, uh, you could eventually, depending on the solution you're using in Kubernetes, you can use more than one and build your volume by aggregating 
multiple EBS volume and writing, for example, in parallel to those drives. So potentially increasing the global performance while at the same time saving costs. So another approach could be instead of using you know, EBS or persistent disks, you could use instant store and ephemeral storage. Right? If you have the right CSI provider, um, then it doesn't matter if your node, you know, the, the challenge with instant store and uh, ephemeral storage is that if you shut down your VM, your node, uh, then you lose your data on that node, right? But if you have a solution that is just constantly replicating, you know, doing synchronous replication between your different volumes, your different nodes, then you're safe as long as you as, as you have at least you know one node running, right? So you can leverage instant store for highly performant workload at a fraction of the cost because suddenly it's it's com it's comprised into your monthly you know just VM instant store uh, cost. You don't have to purchase extra expensive EBS drive. So potentially you can save up to you know three times the the cost you are spending in 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 EBS. So you can do either cost op optimization, multiple EBS drive, or you can do real cost saving by using ephemeral storage, which is another option. And I've seen customers dividing their, their bill by 200, of course, because you don't use EBS anymore, right? Uh, another benefit is suddenly uh, you can enable anything as a service by using the Kubernetes ecosystem, right? So now, as I said, the idea is to have Kubernetes as the cloud operating system. And uh, that means that you can leverage all the Kubernetes innovation, can be fast, uh, can be uh, you know, anything as a service that is operated inside Kubernetes as part of the solution. Right? Of course, uh, this means that you have this standardized across any cloud. And again, this can enable you, actually it can allow you to avoid this vendor or cloud locking if this is something you want to do, right? standardization. Now, of course, on the other side, we have cons. Um, you can enable everything as a service for sure, but you need to learn right, how to do it in Kubernetes. So there is still a learning curve depending on what you want to implement on top. You will have to learn um, you know, new concepts, new technology that runs inside Kubernetes. There is a higher maintenance and operational effort to do because, of course, now, you are, I mean, if you use a managed Kubernetes solution, the Kubernetes environment will be managed by the cloud provider, but you will be responsible for managing your database, upgrading your database, uh, doing backup of your database. All of that will have to be done. I mean, the operator, this is where the operator can help, but still, it's not entirely, it's not managed by your hyperscaler. So it can be an advantage or it can be a cons as well, right? And the last one is, uh, how to enable uh, premium data services, right? So imagine that you run now, you have you want to run your database in, in Kubernetes, is what kind of solution can you use on top to provide you know, replication, encryption, uh, performance optimization, all those uh, things are, they don't come by default inside Kubernetes, right? And I think this is uh, really what cloud native data is all about, is a combination of the cloud native features, um, which this is the one defined by the CNCF essentially, right? Scalability, elasticity, self-healing, uh, observability. Those are the qualification for running, you know, compute um, in Kubernetes and mainly for stateless application. For stateful application, um, again, it's a bit different. So we need to stack up a couple of requirements on top to be really efficient and being able to operate at the same level of availability that you would have by consuming database as a service like RDS, uh, um, Bigtable, and others. So first, ideally, the storage should be distributed, not centralized, uh, meaning that you know, the node, the Kubernetes nodes, if we really want to focus on <clears throat> Kubernetes data, uh, then it the data itself should be hosted in Kubernetes. So the, the storage provider should build uh, the storage layer by leveraging Kubernetes nodes and containers, like essentially eating your own dog food. 
should be replicated um, because if you lose one node, you know your volume potentially, if it's a read write once, needs to be available from another node. Right? Other big requirements. Encryption, which is really important in the cloud, as more enterprise you know migrate sensitive data in the cloud, you need to get this data encrypted, and you need the communication from your microservices accessing the, this data encrypted as well. So uh, in transit and at rest, preferably both encrypted. Um, and you also need to have some sort of self-provisioning for your data as well, because as you move toward this idea of cloud native application and modern application, agile application, all of that, um, this is the notion of shifting left, which means that you want to test your application earlier in the development lifecycle. And as a result, uh, your developers, they also need to have access um, to your data set early on. So you must be able to provide a way for your developer to copy, to provision um, you know, a set of data in Kubernetes on demand and in a way that allows them to test you know, performance, to test you know, different things very early in the de um, development lifecycle. That's the whole idea of shifting left. Uh, and finally, you also, yeah, question? Yes. Uh, what kind of caching for database to be run as worker node and how to do backup and restore databases in Kubernetes? OK, so, so you're again, talking about yeah. availability. And <clears throat> so how uh -huh. do you do this? Yes. So essentially, I would say, um, Caching database to be run. So caching, we don't change really the caching layer. So it's still at the application layer. That won't happen uh, directly in Kubernetes. It will depend on your, you know, you can have your database architecture. You can have Mongo and, uh, you know, MySQL and Redis on top, uh, you know, like this kind of thing. So it's really solved at the application layer, right? You make use of the caching. This is a definition in your application. It just happens that your application will be running in Kubernetes. Um, and then how do you back up and restore? Again, um, part of it is pro um, can be managed by your operator, right? Uh, before I mentioned backup, et cetera, can be part of your operator, or um, potentially it can be part of your storage provider. You know, storage provider can have backup, um, backup, um, uh, oper um, operational uh, features. You can do uh, now in Kubernetes, you can also um, have a leverage snapshot. So the CSI provider essentially can make use of Kubernetes primitives to guarantee snapshot, restore, and cloning. All of that are concepts that are already embedded into Kubernetes. So if you need this directly in the, into the CSI, then you can use a CSI that provide this, or alternatively, uh, there, there are dedicated solutions like Veeam, you know, Kasten, uh, and uh, uh, Valero that allows you to uh, just back up your persistent volume claim, uh, sorry, your persistent volume, and allow you to restore them. So either embedded into the CSI, either from the operator, or like a more specific solution. Like there are three three kind of ways to do it. Thank you. No worry. <clears throat> okay, and the, yeah, the last one, DevOps friendly. So you want, as a requirement for uh, your um, stateful application and your database, you want to have your DevOps tool also hosted into Kubernetes. So if you're talking about CI/CD, of course you can use you know GitHub Actions and whatever you're using. Or if you want to go cloud native and Kube native, you can use something like Tekton. You can use Policy as Code natively. Uh, something like Kiverno. Um, you know, to, to control the number of um, database uh, cluster, you know, uh, replicas. This kind of thing can be managed by Kubernetes native um, DevOps tool sets. So I've mentioned Kiverno, I've mentioned uh, Tekton. There's, you know, you can apply GitOps principle as well with Weave, all of that without leaving the Kubernetes environment, right? So this is a good requirement as well. So now let's get a bit deeper uh, into how to do it. We've seen why we want to do it in Kubernetes. We've seen the requirements. And now let's take a look at you know, what, what are the, the, the steps that are really important to, to try to kind of migrate into Kubernetes. So first, what kind of volumes? Because the database 
ultimately will sit into a volume, into your Kubernetes cluster. So here I've typed a command for you guys. If you want to test it, it will give you all the volumes that are currently supported, which is a lot. They are a lot because they are also a lot of deprecated entry kind of volume drivers. So what, what I mean by entry, so prior to the CSI, which is the container storage you know, interface we're going to be talking about in, a, in just in one minute, before that kind of standardization for plugins, all the current plugins that you have in Kubernetes, the storage plugins, were developed as entry driver, so directly into the Kubernetes main you know, trunk. So every vendor had to do pull request and commit code into the Kubernetes source code directly. And uh, this is why Kubernetes still have all those volume um, type. This was the kind of legacy way of doing things. Some are still required, and it's not completely, um, I think it's not envisioned to deprecate all of them, right? But the standard now, <coughs> excuse me, is to use uh, the CSI because that's a standard. So the main providers today, so persistent volume claim, most common one that is used through a CSI. Um, this is mainly what you're going to be using for your database. Um, MTDR, which is temporary uh, file system, can be in memory or temporary uh, on disk. Host path, which is a local path to your node. You can also mount as volume config map. Secret, downward API, which is contextual information about the pod. For example, you know the, the pod IP. Not, uh, pod IP is not a bad example for volume. Uh, but for example, if you want to have access to annotation, uh, labels, all of that can be mounted. All this information can be mounted into volumes. Uh, and also something a bit, uh, something a bit uh, recent, which is ephemeral uh, volumes, which is kind of the same as empty gear, but with extra components and also managed with CSI and gives you another set of capabilities like limit the size, do snapshots, all of that. But um, where I'm going with this is nowadays, right? what you want to do is using the CSI driver because the CSI driver is providing you with a bunch of extra features which are required um, you know, to run produ production grade, I would say, databases. So things like, dynamic provisioning and deprovisioning of a volume, right? You don't have to create the PV and the PVC. You can just create PVC, persistent volume claim, and then all the volumes can get uh, dynamically provisioned for you. Things like, of course, attaching, detaching a volume from a node, mounting and mounting, uh, creating, deleting snapshot, uh, provisioning a new volume from a snapshot. So you can see that all the new, um, you know, shiny tools, shiny features that Kubernetes uh, has been uh, providing you for the last couple of years now, because it's yeah 2018 uh, for the CSI, all those new features are only available through the CSI. So again, kind of answering the question from before, if you need those extra you know, snapshot, backup features, all of that, you need uh, you know, a proper CSI to do this. So this is really the key here, right? Use CSI as much as you can, right? And then use the standard Kubernetes primitive, which are two ones, right? We have persistent volume and persistent volume claims. So persistent volume, this is effectively the volume itself. This is where the data reside. Um, and we can see that there are essentially two way to provision a volume, so persistent volume. Either you manually create a PVC, a PV, and attach the PV to the PVC, or you can use you know, more dynamic provisioning or dynamic uh, provisioning CSI. Every time you're going to create a PVC, automatically the, the CSI will also provision the persistent, the backend persistent volume, which is a lot easier. Right? So the idea, again, persistent volume, what you need to uh, specify at the end is potentially you know, the, the, the storage class. You can leave it empty as well. It will, it's the first storage class. <coughs> that is going to match, uh, we'll, we'll be provisioning this for you. The access mode, the storage capacity, and then the name of the persistent volume claim. Right. This is how you attach a PV to a PVC. You reference the persistent volume claim within the PV. That's one way to do it. Right. And the second uh, first class object will be a persistent volume claim, which effectively, as the name stands for, is um, 
claiming a persistent volume under your name, right? So with dynamic provisioning, it does two actions at the same time. It creates the claims and the volume. Here, um, depending on the solution you're using, this is also, um, for example, if you're using on that, right? That's a, just another example. This is where you can also manage the number of replicas. For other, you know, storage provider, this is where as well you will be able to influence some extra features that are not available natively in Kubernetes. Still using using the the, the Kubernetes way of configuring things. So just by using labels, you can effectively um, enable and configure special features on top of your uh, Kubernetes environment. So basically managing your underlying storage system by using labels, which is quite helpful, right? So again, here you type, uh, you specify the access mode. So in Kubernetes, there are a couple of access mode, uh, read, write once, read, write many, uh, and we have uh, read only many, and we have read, write once pod, right? So typically, if you want a database, this is going to be read write once. Uh, actually, this is just this picture here. The difference uh, read write many is for NFS, like shared file system, and um, read write once pod, as opposed to the other ones, which gives you like read write once. This is per node. You can uh, write once, so meaning like. Um, the node will have access to a particular volume, right? That particular node will have access, will be um, building that particular volume for your pods. Now, if you have multiple pods running on that node, typically uh, it will depend, you know, if it's a deployment, then of course, if you have a deployment with read write once, which is a bad ID, uh, only the first pod that is spin up is going to be accessing that volume, right? Um, and the difference is that read, one, read write once pod, it guarantees that only that particular pod can have access to a volume as opposed to read write only, which guarantees that only that particular node will have access to a volume right? and nothing more. So that's the main difference. But here there's also, um, you know, this, is, this part is confusing people. So how can you mount volume uh, in Kubernetes? This is where you have the separation between stateful and stateless application. On the left here, this is a deployment, stateless application. On the right, this is stateful application, so a stateful set. On the left, um, in a deployment, when you create a Kubernetes deployment in the template, typically uh, this is where you mine the volume. But the challenge is because all the pods, when you create your deployment, all the uh, created pod, by the deployment controller will share the same volume, right? There's no other way to define it. In the template, you define one volume. So it means that all the pods deployed as part of the deployment will share the volume. So there's only one solution. That volume, if, if that needs to be a read-write um, you know, volume, has to be based on a shared file system, so based on NFS. And you don't want to run a database on NFS because of performance, of course. So this is why stateful set is very important where you are running database or any stateful application. It's going to be using um, a, pers a persistent persistent claim uh, volume claim template. So what that means is instead of having all the pods getting you know access to the same volume. The controller, the stateful set controller, is going to provision individual volume per pods. So all the pods will have a, a, a stable name, right? Starting with zero. So uh, my database dash zero, my database dash one, my database dash two. And this name will never change. If you delete the pod and create a new one, that will be the same pod with the same data attached. The PVC won't be, and the data won't be destroyed, right? So this is the reason why it's very important to use stateful set. And stateful set also requires a headless service, right? Well, I'm not going to go in detail there, but the, the point is if you're building database or stateful application, deployment and uh, is not necessarily the right way to do it, except if NFS is okay for you, right? If NFS is fine for your application, you can do it. Uh, if you need more performance and one volume per pod, then you have to go stateful set, right? So, and on top of that, once you have 
chosen your right you know, Kubernetes native object to build your application or your database, you need to select your what, what is going to be your storage provider. So here, again, we are talking about different patterns. So you can have on the one side, using you can be using a CSI that still basically is a wrapper around legacy storage, right? That's one solution. Uh, I wouldn't advise for this one. What we want to do is really build a Kubernetes distributed storage or um, uh, container attached storage. This is the, the paradigm where you run Kubernetes storage within Kubernetes. And it's managed by using Kubernetes microservices and container. Again, it's like eating your own dog food where uh, your storage solution is going to be running as container and presenting storage to your application um, you know, database all you know, through your containers. Right? So everything is container-based, stayed within Kubernetes, is hosted by Kubernetes, and developed for Kubernetes. So a good example is Rook with Ceph. All the different components, the, the different agent, daemon set, uh, node agents, all of that is running directly into your worker nodes, right? So then you can go into a centralized model or a non-centralized model. It will be up to you. Uh, another example is, you know, on that, the company I'm working for, exactly same principle. You can select here, uh, we have the different worker nodes. And you can say, for example, only um, maybe two workers will participate into uh, will participate into the storage provision into the storage space. All the the other workers uh, they will be acting just for you know hosting um, containers as compute nodes. And depending on the solution, obviously you need to have like a protocol to allow you to get access from your application to your volume. Still thinking the volume is local, but because realistically. The volume is is like, for example, here we have the application on one node. The volume is provisioned on another node, right? But from the application perspective, it, it's transparent. It still think it's a local um, bind mount, right? From from a Linux perspective, it still appears as local. It just ha happens that the solution underneath provide a network uh, protocol to get access to the storage, right? But realistically, this is still appearing as local storage, not as NFS storage. It's block device we are talking here, right? Still performance. <laughs> or you can say, okay, no, um, every node is going to be participating um, into uh, into your storage cluster and can potentially host, host, uh, host data, right? That's the idea. So a couple of other solutions I've mentioned uh, Rook, which is a CNCF project that makes use can make use of Ceph underneath. Uh, on that, which is um, formerly uh, Storage OS, we have OpenEBS has been acquired by DataCore. Portworks has been acquired by Pure Storage. Robin.io has been uh, acquired by Rakuten Symphony. So as you can see, this is quite a trendy area where um, you know all the solutions tend to get acquired over time, and um, yeah, there's potentially uh, a solution that that fits your your particular. Um, requirements here. So the only thing I wanted to um, to do, like five minutes, is to show you how to do it uh, within Kubernetes. So for this, I'm going to be uh, using a, a quick uh, GK cluster. Let me share back my uh, screen. There you go. So let's take a look at our uh, Kubernetes cluster here. So I think it's a three-node cluster. Okay, so as I said, the first thing, let's check. Yep, if you can <laughs> zoom in. There. Okay, yeah. sure. Better? Uh, the fonts. Yeah, I've, I've increased the font. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure about the uh, the display because it may be, um, you know, bigger. Uh, you have bigger display. Yeah, bigger. So it's going to be on a, the uh, multiple line. Let, let's take a look. Okay. So we have the nodes there. Um, yes. Let's check the PVC. So I should have like zero PVC at the moment. So what we're going to be doing? I'm going to show you first how to do it uh, with Pod, right? Natively PVC create PVC. Uh, automatically create a PV and then attach the, the, the PVC to the pod 
um, like do this and then how we can do it maybe in an easier way by just using a stateful set, right? So first off, we have, we need to define the PVC, right? So, uh, oh, I need to show you the, the storage class because all that depends on the storage class, right? So the storage class will essentially tell you which, which CSI you will be using. So in Google, uh, you know, I was mentioning like, um, um, so EBS like drive, like, you know, persistent disk. So Google persistent disk will make use of a, a particular CSI to provision your volume, uh, essentially from, you know, a persistent disk, make them available into Kubernetes. This is how you can do this by, by using, um, um, the, the Google CSI, same thing in, in AWS, you can use the, um, the EBS CSI and then dynamically is going to be provisioning PVC that are backed by and PV that are backed by uh, EBS volume. So here I'm going to be using the um, this one, which is uh, the persistent disk for standard read write ones. And I'm going to be also using like the on that replicated ones. So let's first create our uh, PVC. So this is standard read write, sorry, read write only. We want uh, five gig and let's just give it a name PVC-1. And then you see basic, okay. So still pending. So why it's pending? Uh, depending on the CSI you're using, if you have CSI that is topology aware, uh, you need to wait for the community scheduler to schedule a pod. And then the CSI will provision the storage that will be local to the node where the pod has been scheduled, right? So if um, if you dynamically create, um, if you um, create the, if the PVC is provisioned uh, as soon as you create, so immediate, right, immediately, then um, what you may risk is the risk is that potentially if the pod is scheduled on a node where the PVC hasn't been created, right, on another node, then the pod won't be able to get scheduled. Right, so it's like a chicken and egg issue. If now you're using a CSI that doesn't care about you know the location, you know because it's providing like a network protocol to to access a remote uh, volume, then you don't care. But in the case of Google, uh, this is topology aware, so we need to create the pod and then the volume will be provisioned when the pod is, is scheduled. Right, so for this, uh, we create the pod, so we call it my pod one. The only thing we need to to do really is specify. Uh, the claim name, right? This is PVC-1, which is the right one. And um, create our pod. Okay. Ending, but as soon, now if you go into, if you monitor the PVC, it should be, you know, it's bound now. It's bound because the pod has been scheduled on a node and automatically the CSI has created now the, the PVC and um, the volume on the node where the pod has been deployed. So if I do now, Nick, uh, yeah. the, the storage class you have created, it was demanding uh, for basically, it's waiting for a consumer. Yeah, waiting, that's correct. This yeah. is here, this is where you uh, you have the difference, waiting for well, consumer yes. or immediate, right? Immediate, uh, yes. Because even if you do immediate and uh, the, BBC, the BV, the persistent volume has like an affinity to a certain node, Yeah, it, it will work. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, it will work. It will work. But immediate it will be a waste of time in cloud. So, I mean, why why should you use the storage if uh, if the workload is not? Here? Yeah, yeah, it's not here. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. And uh, so here the um, the difference is that so with the on that one you can use both, but for some a CSI immediate is just not an option because it cannot really work except right. if you have this, you know, manual storage, um, you know, a node affinity, this kind of things, right? Okay. So, um, yeah. So essentially now we have a pod running and if you go okay, exec here, my pod dash one, and we have, um, let me just use bash here. I think that's slash date. I can't remember that. Yeah, that's slash MNT equals mount. Yeah. Yeah, here, if I do touch test. Yeah, so I have a, a volume there. I've put some data in it. So uh, we just checked it, it's been working, right? 
So we can do also the same with uh, an on that volume now, and I'm going to just show you the, the difference. So here, the idea is to have a, uh, because there, I've used Google, right? But the, the storage, except if you've been using a, um, let's say, a persistent disk that is regional, so potentially um, replicating between zones, your data is not replicated, right? So let's say you want to replicate your, uh, your data, um, and for that, you can be using on that, right? So um, on that, if you look at the storage class on that replicated, the only difference, if I do kubectl uh, get storage class on that uh, replicated uh, dash o YAML, you will see that um, I've got I've enabled the feature, right? Remember, all this is whether it's on that or another solution. Uh, this is the kube native. Uh, pattern. You manage the feature using labels and parameters, right? So here, the only thing I had to do to choose, I want to replicate all the volumes that will be, um, you know, provisioned by using that storage class is this line, right? Number of replica, one. I can go up to five if I want to, right? So now it's the same thing. I can do just the PVC, Will be here on that. Uh, oops, on that replicated, and I'm going to call it uh, PVC two, and I'm going to create a new pod. Well, we can hear you type. Uh, well, it's <laughs> <laughs> so again, it's slash mnt. Here, I'm going to replace by. This one, and I want also claim name. Remember, we have to adapt it to here. And now I'm going to deploy this new pod. Oops. Uh -huh. Oh, sorry. I didn't create the volume. <laughs> so we create the volume. Right. OK, so if we. Uh, Look at the volumes. You can see the, the 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 on that volume is already provisioned for you, right? So here is already attached to the node, and we don't care because regardless of where the the pod is going to be scheduled, it can it can have access to that volume. And if I do a storage OS get volume, I will see uh, the volume there, and I will see that um, it's also replicated one on one, right? So uh, now let's provision the pod. Here we go. And here again, same thing is going to be attaching the, 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 the volume to, to that pod, right? And now it's running. If I do the same thing, again, if I do uh, exact here, that's pod 2. Set MNT. It also works the same way, right? So the only difference is now, um, of course, we will always try to collocate the pod with the node that has the storage at attached. But now, if the node were to fail, dynamically, the pod will be restarted on another node without lo losing access to that volume. Right? If you do this in Google or in AWS, in different AZ, that won't work. If you, uh, the node is in another AZ, the, volume won't be, the, the pod won't be restarted because the EBS volume is attached to a node that has failed. So if you want to restart it on another AZ, for example, you would need to replicate um, the EBS volume and attach the EBS volume to another node, et cetera, et cetera. So you need some sort of automation. Uh, with a solution like, like on that, it's totally automatic. We're not the only one. There are also other solutions uh, that does that. But of course, I'm working for on that. I'm showing you how to do it with a with us. And the last part I wanted to show you is, OK, I've got this with a pod, but that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Because I don't have any controller that control a pod. If the pod fails, then, then I'm screwed anyway. So what you want to have is a stateful set. So the properties of the stateful sets is this particular set of um, you know, YAML lines that allows you to create a volume claim template. So you're going to see the difference. So now, um, so the only thing I'm going to um, specify here is the storage space. So how much, uh, what the capacity I want, storage capacity, and the storage class. 
so here, let's um, deploy this, and you're going to see the difference. So as I do this, OK, if what it's going to be creating is three, if you, if you look again at the STL configuration, it's going to have three replicas. And all those three replicas will have individually a distinct volume attached to them. So now if I go, and the difference is also that, you know, um, in a stateful set, every pod is creating sequentially one after the other uh, because they are pets, not cattle anymore, right? So the second one can um, can be only created after the first one has been provisioned, right? The, the, there is this sequence uh, that is there by default. So we have to wait. So already, already two has been created, but I should see three more PVC now, right? So you can see I've got now... Um, PVC one, PVC two. So here, my data, yeah, because it's it's a uh, it's a multi-line. <laughs> the font is too big, but yeah, essentially, I've got three more. I've got my ST, that database, my STS dash zero dash one and dash two. So now I've got a uh, higher level controller, which is my stateful set, and um, it is controlling the number of state, uh, of pods as well as the number of PVCs and how they are attached. If I was to destroy a, a, um, a particular, and this is why, uh, for example, if I uh, CTL delete a pod, which is mysds-0, right? The controller will recreate a new pod but the data will still be there. The PVC doesn't get deleted. It's still there. It's going to be attached to the same one, right? If I get PVC, the PVC hasn't been created, uh, hasn't been destroyed, right? It's still the, the same one as before, right? 111 seconds before ago, right? So essentially, this is the last part I wanted to show you. Um, so uh, just like a conclusion, I think we are a bit over time. Um, me... uh, we are okay with time. Okay, okay, with time. So it's, anyway, I just want to share like the last couple of slides. And that's basically it. Okay, here we go. I think you have to add it again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's fine, no worries. So yeah, um, what we've done here, uh, we've been going through the provisioning of pods, PVC, attaching PV to PVC. Uh, we've been doing this with you know, native cloud disk. We've been doing this with on that. The same would be available for another solution that provide extra feature sets for, for your data. Um, the point is really to show you that, one, use stateful set because this is the right construct to guarantee that you will have one volume per pod. Second, this is also the... Um, you know, most of the time, this is the construct that will be, that is used by Kubernetes uh, and database operators. And also, again, to match the requirement we've been mentioning before, um, this is all about being able to provide features that are not enabled in Kubernetes by default. So, database encryption, database encryption, uh, database replication, disaster recovery, all these extra feature sets. So in conclusion, hopefully the takeaway for today is uh, Kubernetes is ready for stateful application with cloud native data. So if you are hesitating, you're like, OK, I want to migrate my data into the cloud, should I do it by using a, a database as a service or natively in Kubernetes? Uh, hopefully, you've got some uh, food for thought. Uh, to give you options between both, you have some data to uh, to take into consideration, uh, you know, for taking your decision. But the key is to make sure that you can reach the right level of availability, uh, recoverability, scale, and performance for the solution you're using. Remember, if you're using a platform as a service, database as a service, most of the time, uh, disaster recovery, high availability is limited. One AZ or potentially multiple easy, multiple region, but then you have to put the glue. With Kubernetes, 
database operator, you can stretch your cluster between availability zone. You can use uh, topology key to make uh, topology aware um, you know, data. So there's a lot of solution that you can uh, implement to increase the availability in the cloud by using Kubernetes and the appropriate storage solution. And finally, last point, persistent storage challenges are not addressed by default, right? So don't think that Kubernetes will tick all the box once you want to move uh, production database in, into your cluster, right? Pick the solution that suits your requirements. So with that said, I've been more than thrilled to share with you all my thoughts for today. Hopefully it's been useful uh, and you've learned uh, one thing or two. I don't know if we have any other question or maybe what did you want to discuss other things like thought you, you, you had before, right? <coughs> you're on mute, you're on mute. <laughs> we have some questions. Uh, okay. There was one question from Khaldrad regarding the storage. Uh, is it external or internal? Is it clustered or non-clustered? So basically, there is a confusion when you uh, about the abstraction, the physical volume, and where it, uh -huh. and where is it consumed from? Yeah. Okay. So this is back to um, the difference I made between uh, basic CSI and the CAS thing. So the container attached storage. <clears throat> so typically the CSI. So so let's you know if we start again from scratch, you have Kubernetes you have CSI, and then you have Kubernetes objects, volumes, etc. The CSI is an abstraction for the volumes. So the volumes themselves, they can be pretty much anywhere, right? They don't have to, to reside inside the Kubernetes cluster. So for example, you can do Rook plus Ceph with an existing Ceph cluster. And the Ceph cluster is just a, 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 a you know, many storage node you have somewhere. What I'm trying to say today is, is not the Kube native way to do it. It's not appropriate for public cloud, right? If you want to get this, uh, van avoid the vendor locking and bring your own innovation, right, into your Kubernetes cluster and do this high, uh, you know, level standardization within Kubernetes, then it makes sense to turn Kubernetes into a hyper-converged solution and essentially building vSAN, so VMware vSAN, inside Kubernetes. And this is the, the, the latest set of solutions I've mentioned. So, um, you know, Rook, uh, we, we Ceph, uh, Robin, Portworks, Ondats, uh, and uh, Ioneer, and others. This is what we are building. This is essentially all inside Kubernetes cluster and hyperconverge. And then you can choose where you want to put your data. Is it all nodes that are going to participate into uh, provisioning the storage, or do you want to build storage node as opposed to compute nodes? Uh, so, but still, right, the storage is handled within Kubernetes. So, my recommendation, if you're looking for a way to bring all this innovation with a, a pure, you know, a standard framework, then yes, definitely use a CSI that gives you this ability to create the storage layer entirely in Kubernetes. And then, regardless, you know, you can have all the nodes provisioning storage or just storage node and have, but you need to have, you know, encryption, replication, all of that, make sure that you can also address those. Okay. So <coughs> the devil in the details, uh, you don't have water? <laughs> what that? Water. Do you don't have some water? See, si. yeah, yeah. Uh, whatever. Okay. So the devil in the details. Now, when you say that Kubernetes democratizes the uh, cloud and I can have multi-cloud and I use uh, Kubernetes abstractions, but I still, if I need to build my HCI, if I need to build my uh, <coughs> my uh, HCI cluster that, that looks like a VMware vSAN, I have to use, uh, for example, in Google, Google Persistent Disk and AWS, uh, EBS, I have to use the local uh, node storage. Or, uh, or storage attached to the node. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how how does that work? Okay, so um, in terms again, different, all related to the CSI. Let's say you're using EBS, right? So your node will have EBS volume attached, right? So and the C the EBS um, CSI will provision all the persistent volume within those EBS volumes, right? for your containers. So essentially, you attach an EBS volume to a node. The CSI will use that EBS volume space to provision and to create persistent volume that are subsequently 
attached to your containers. But the challenge with this, again, remember, the disk is attached locally to your node, right? This is EBS. So EBS are network attached storage. This is not device inside the node, right? This is network attached storage. Um, and then what happens if the node fail? You need potentially, you need to attach, if you restart, if the, 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 the pod is resorted on another node, the node needs to get access to that EBS volume. If the node is another availability zone, well, you need replication and then you need manually or via, via an automation tool to attach that replicated EBS volume to the right node. So this is quite complex, quite convoluted. This is why you have other CSI like uh, you know, open EBS, like uh, you know, what we do at on that, because then you replicate, it's natively replicated at the Kubernetes layer. So that if the node fail, even though you have the EBS volume that is attached to it, the volume is replicated on another node, and that node also has you know EBS drive or EBS volume attached to it. It just happens that another solution is doing the replication for you at the Kubernetes layer, right? So basically you have the data and then you have an engine that, and the goal of that engine inside Kubernetes is to replicate that data, basically interfacing through the CSI. So you have the container accessing the CSI, the CSI accesses the volume and between the CSI and the backend node, you have this extra engine that does the replication. Um, but again, then you have to think about, should I use EBS or can I make use of instant store, right? Because now the data is replicated across availability zone, et cetera. So the real question is, do you still need EBS? Because you can make use of the local storage, like the physical disk, the physical NVMe that are located into your nodes. So think about the performance. So EBS volumes, I don't know, like GP2, GP2, GP3, like 5,000, 10,000 IOPS, something like that. I don't know. Um, if we're talking about NVMe, that's five times this, right? Or so 10 times this locally on your NVMe, plus you don't lose the availability layer because your volume is still replicated at the Kubernetes layer, right? And even if you're using EBS, uh, maybe instead of using like reserved IOPS, uh, you can use GP2 and GP3 and combine them and aggregate them together with a solution like on that, rewrite personally on every disk you present us. So if you said, okay, I'm gonna attach three EBS nodes, uh, EBS volume to that particular Kubernetes nodes, a uh, solution like on that, will, will, um, you, you create a PVC and this PVC will act as a red 10 across all the EBS volume. So essentially giving you more write and read power, right? More pipes. Of course, you're still limited by, if you replicate, if you do replication, this is synchronous replication, right? So you're limited by the network bandwidth, which will depend upon your instance size as well, right? So you, you have to be, there's a lot of parameters there, right? But the idea is that one. If you use a solution that use EBS, Maybe and if you want high availability, EBS alone is not enough, in my opinion, because you need multi-AZ solution. Remember, like an AZ can easily fail. With EBS, well, you're, you're a bit stuck, so you need an extra solution. Um, extra solution like port works on that, whatever. Um, and then with this kind of solution, then there is the second thought, which is should I use open EBS, uh, should I use EBS volume altogether? If I'm fine with NVMe locally on my instance, uh, AB, um, you know, AWS instance. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. that clarifies things. Yes. So a follow-up question from Khalid. What about live replication in active-active scenarios? So that, I guess that's what you were uh, referring to. Yeah. So this is, I, I'm, I'm talking, so uh, let me put different scenario here. For me, active-active is a stretch cluster across AZ. This is active active. You wouldn't do active active across region, right? That wouldn't make a lot of sense to me just because of you know latency and everything. So it starts to be complicated to do active active across cluster. So my advice, if you if you of course replication, uh, you know, like synchronous replication, single cluster, multi-AZ, use topology key. Now the good thing like in AWS or Google cloud, you can use, and others, 
you can use uh, in the managed uh, managed Kubernetes, uh, the cloud provider, the hyperscaler, will dynamically populate um, the availability zone name in the topology key. So you will find like US West one or whatever inside yeah. the node topology key. And a solution like on that, as you know, I'm not sure about others. I think they do it as well, but um, we can use that topology key to place. Uh, to, to create like initial volume placement and replication. So we can make sure that uh, if you enable tip topology aware placement, that the replicated volumes are not in the same availability zone as the primary volume, right? This is how you do active active by using, you know, availability zone as a topology key. <coughs> um, this is one way of doing things. Now for active standby disaster recovery, um, then it's more about you know um, rep doing like snapshot replication into another cluster and you know um, recovering your application, let's say manually into a new cluster. So you need to uh, just your manifest redeploy them um, in 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 you know your standby cluster or your you know test cluster or your recovery cluster where you share the load with other workloads, but the data will be there, right? If you can use this kind of solution. I know there are solutions that does this. Currently, I'm talking for on that. We don't we don't have a um, like off solution for disaster recovery. This is in the pipes. So uh, you can, um, you know, watch what we, we're doing by the end of this year. Uh, we, we should have this definitively. But yeah, this is active active, which is synchronous versus active standby. This is more like a snapshot, asynchronous replication and more manual things. Right? Okay, uh, okay. we'll do the random draw for the three KCN winners. So we'll select basically the first uh, uh, three. Okay, the first time, it uh, doesn't work, it works. I'm clicking on the wrong one. So the first one is Aisa, Aisa or Aisa Nima. Okay, I'll uh, get in, in touch with you, Aisa, uh, Isa, I guess. <laughs> okay. Uh, congratulations, and let's do another one. Anarog Kumar, okay, you are the second winner. And Saad Ashahri, okay, thank you, uh, Saad, Isa, and Kumar. We'll I'll get in touch with you soon. Nice. Thank you, Nick. It was very uh, useful and interesting. And uh, my pleasure. We have, we have some me. question regarding Rook, but I, it was answered uh, during the call. Perfect. Uh, other than that, uh, there were questions about are we going to handle uh, data security and data governance later on and stuff like that on uh, future sessions. Yeah, I mean, I would be more than <laughs> happy to talk <laughs> about policy as code. I mentioned it actually, uh, I mentioned Kyverno in policy as code. Uh, yes. I've done a couple of, uh, of talk and, um, and things around Kyverno with stateful set and databases. Uh, I'd be more than happy to do this again. But yeah, definitely, again, Kubernetes is the right place to bring all those concepts, um, you know, just as a way to innovate. So yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you again. Thank you, Nick. Thank you on that for providing us, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you everybody that uh, attended and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, bye everyone. Bye-bye. See you next one. Bye.